to, to talk to some of the individuals here who served in the, in the armed forces, it's, it's always important to me to reconnect with some of my roots because the best graduate school I ever went to was the U.S. Army. Uh, and I'm sure people could say that about the U.S. Navy, the Marine Corps, whatever they served in. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a perspective that is different than many of us have. This is a perspective about somebody from South Vietnam, not an American. Uh, we've seen the Ken Burns special and a lot of the uh, stories about uh, Vietnam, the tragedy of Vietnam, the courage that was exhibited in Vietnam, and the lessons that were learned. Uh, this is a story that uh, came, to me, came to me as a gift. It was kind of a divine gift, if you want to look at it that way. So I'm going to talk to, to you a little bit about, see if I can make, oh, it works. The world looked away Vietnam after the war. And it really is Kwok Pham's story. Now, uh, you won't recognize this guy right here. This is me with hair. Okay, my wife doesn't even recognize me with hair. It's up here only to tell you that I was in the Army. How many veterans do we have in the room? Jeez, we're, there's a lot more than I have on Cape Cod. <laughs> okay, and how many Vietnam veterans? A lot. I served Vietnam era. I would never presume to call myself a Vietnam veteran. I was commissioned in 74, the Vietnam era supposedly ended in 75. I don't call myself a Vietnam veteran. I'm proud of the fact that I served in the armed forces, but prouder to have known people that served in Vietnam. And many didn't make it back, and many got wounded, and many brought, brought those psychic wounds back with them. So I want to make that crystal clear. I never presumed to, to call myself, other than maybe a little bit more knowledgeable about the military uh, than, than others, because I served in the military for three and a half years and then 10 years in the Guard and the Reserves. Uh, I was looking out at the boats today. Well, I guess you call them ships in the Navy. Uh, a lot of Navy people here? Just a few, I gather. Okay, I was looking out and, and I said to my wife as we were having coffee, I said, you know, I could write a book about what I don't know about ships. And she said, well, you actually did write a book about what you don't know about ships because I had to learn a lot as a land lover and as, as an aviator uh, and somebody who served in the, in, the, on, in the ground in the Army. But this is truly not about me. It's not about you. It's about Kwok Pham. Kwok Pham, whose arc of his life paralleled the arc of what we saw throughout the French War, the American War, and the post-war period in Vietnam. Quoc Pham and his family lived in Vietnam that was south, then it became all Vietnam. And we as Americans oftentimes have an existential view, perhaps human beings do. When we walk out of the room, it ceases to exist. Well, rooms don't cease to exist when we walk out of the room. Rooms are back there, but we just don't know what's happening to them. Why did I come to write this book. I'm going to tell you just a short story. I was on active duty, of course, when Vietnam fell. April 29th, 1975, happened to be April 30th on the other side of the international dateline. I was in an officer's club in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, and I saw the photos on that flickering, those old-fashioned flickering TVs that nobody remembers anymore, and I saw those flickering photos of the fall of Vietnam. And the young lieutenants that I was with, we were 22, we were just drinking beer and having dinner and we looked across and there were some captains and majors. And, and at, that point, at that point, they were ancient to me. They were perhaps 35. Uh, and I looked, at, looked there and I saw a look in their eyes as they watched those flickering screens. And there was this thousand, miles, thousand yard stare there was this trying to make meaning out of something that Americans hadn't experienced before. They were struggling with making meaning. You could see it in their eyes, they didn't say the words. And I, I stored that in the back of my mind, but I forgot it. And I went on with my active duty career and I served with people that had learned so much in Vietnam. General Gordon Sullivan was a lieutenant colonel that I worked, worked for. Gordon Sullivan became the chief of staff of the army, four star. And he brought the lessons he learned from Vietnam to create a new army. 
And so we moved forward into the future. And I moved forward with my career and I saw that my gaze was averted from Vietnam. Vietnam was over. Whew. We don't have all these riots anymore. We don't have people protesting anymore. We can go on with our lives. And we did go on with our lives and we averted our gaze. But then one day, uh, this good looking guy on the left, Captain Tom Bushy, uh, the captain of the uh, Maritime Academy ship, Kennedy, uh, called me up. He's my twin brother. He's the older twin. He's 22 minutes older than me. Uh, and he called me up and he says, I've got a story for you. I said, well, that's great. I, I, uh, tell me your story. He says, well, I want to send it over to you. It's a story about somebody who escaped from Vietnam. And I said, well, you know, send it over to me. It was a PDF. I promptly lost it. I didn't, I didn't, brothers do that to each other. I promptly lost it. But the story was about a man named Quoc Pham. And on the left you see Hung Pham. Hung Pham was a ship's officer and still is on the training ship Kennedy for the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. He's a graduate of Massachusetts Maritime Academy. And he was nine years old when he escaped with his father. Nine years old when he escaped out to sea and made it to safety. And one time, and I, I've learned that uh, maritime guys are no different than army guys, it was over a beer that the story came out. And they talked about that escape. And Tom listened to the story, my brother Tom listened to the story and said, your father has to tell this story because it was more than an escape by sea. It was what happened as the lights went out in South Vietnam, what happened as they went to re-education camps, as they went to war with China, as they went to war with Cambodia, and as they tried to make their way out of the country. So Tom sent it over to me, and he called me up a month later and said, did you read it? I promptly found it, opened it up, and read it. I said, boy, this is a pretty compelling story. He said, I need you to meet a man named Kwok Pham, Hung Pham's father. Have lunch with him. Just have lunch with him. So he came over to Hyannis. He, he lives in California now and there was visiting his son. He came to Hyannis and we sat down and had lunch in a place called Mike's Pizza for about an hour and a half. And I sat and talked to this man, a gentle soul, a wonderful soul, an unbelievably bright soul. There was a depth there that I detected. But I also saw a look that I had not seen since April 29th, 1975. I saw a thousand yard stare trying to make meaning of what happened to him and what happened to his country. And he needed to work through that. And he wanted somebody to tell his story. And he looked at me with the gentlest eyes and the kindest expression that he could. And he said, will you write my story? And I said, I can only try. And so we set out to try to write his story, to tell what happened after Vietnam, after we left Vietnam, after the country fell. So I, I had an approach. I have studied neuroscience. Believe it or not, I do study things like that, even though I'm an Army guy. We, we, uh, you're supposed to laugh. The Navy guys are supposed to laugh at the Army. And I will only use uh, monosyllabic words for the Army guys in the back of the word, back of the room. Um, but I, I have studied neuroscience, and memories are the frailest things we can have. We don't really recollect. You're going to walk out of this room and hear different things at this talk today. E each one of you have a different recollection. That's how memories work. And each time we access a memory, it, we change it a little bit. It's fascinating how our brains work. So I had to say, look, Kwok, you can tell me what happened, but I'm going to have to check it out. And he would often laugh when I would check it out, and he was proven true. Verify facts were necessary. And then ultimately, uh, don't accept anything at face value. And sometimes I had to do my own analysis because there's a lot of stuff out there that might necessarily be based in fact. It's based on somebody else's recollection. So the research took quite a bit of time. Uh, we spent FaceTime, God bless technology, every two weeks for an hour to an hour and a half. Reading somebody's emotions, reading their words, 
and hearing their heart. That's one of the most difficult things, but one of the, one of the most wonderful things I've ever been able to do. Sometimes I had to give Kwok three or four minutes as he would collect his emotions when he talked about what happened to him, what happened to his family, what happened to people that didn't make it out of the camps. I did a, a lot of research at libraries and finally I, I used a commercial search engine. New York, the Boston Public Library is a great resource, but if you go to a search engine, you can go through 70,000 periodicals in about a second and uh, you can do a lot more uh, keyword research. And then I, I spent a lot of time with the captain of the maritime ship who taught me, what's a bar? I know that's a dumb thing for an army guy to say, but what's a bar? I didn't know what a bar was, so he had to explain that to me. I said, how do you, how do you on a certain sea state, how do you approach uh, waves? He had to teach me that. Um, but he also had to let me go on the ship. I spent two different short cruises on the sh training ship Kennedy. Statute of limitations is over and my brother is retired, so uh, I was able to go through the Cape Cod Canal on a foggy day in the training ship Kennedy. And I got to join the pilot and climb a Jacob's Ladder. You all know what a Jacob's Ladder was. I had no idea what, was, what, it, what, what it is. A Jacob's Ladder is perhaps one of the most inelegant things I've ever climbed. It's very difficult to climb a Jacob's Ladder, especially when it's dark and it's wet. But it, it taught me so much. And then I got to talk to Navy, Navy experts. Uh, one, of the, one of my dearest friends now that is an expert is Admiral Gene Connard. Somebody might know him. I guess he was a two-star um, in, in, the, in the Navy. And I got in contact with him through an Air Force general that I used to know, that I used to work for. And I got to talk to a four-star admiral and for a former army captain talking to a four-star admiral is pretty darn impressive, uh, Admiral Jerry Johnson. And he freely gave of his time and talked about the actual rescue. And then I got to deal with the, the archives people. The archives people, I didn't have to go to Washington, you can do it online now. And I was able to find the deck logs from the USS San Jose, and I was able to find photos and I was able, even able to get help in taking pictures of the photos to get the DPI requirement for publication. <clears throat> the writing process, if you ever want to write a book, um, you have to want to write a book. You have to have it in your heart, you have to have it in your gut. Uh, I didn't know I was going to write a book until I was about six months into it and then I knew I had to write a book. I had to write a man's story and a story that I felt needed to be told. Um, a lot of rewrites, 12 beta readers, 11 returned them, 11 returned completely marked up. I had seven military people that did the reviews, uh, Air, Air Force, uh, two Air Force officers, a, a Marine colonel who had done an air tour and a ground tour in Vietnam, ground tour first and an air tour second, four naval officers and of course the maritime uh, community. They all did those reviews for me and uh, didn't, uh, didn't cut me any slack, and I'm glad they didn't. And then uh, finally I had a very, very tough uh, editor uh, named Kendra Burgess who found the, manus found the book in my manuscript. So let's talk a little bit about the history of Vietnam. Now, most of you probably know a lot of the history of Vietnam. Does everybody want me to skip this part? We don't really know that much about the history of Vietnam, and for those of you that are experts in uh, Asian history. I apologize because I'll probably gloss over and miss some of the details, but I think I've, I've, I've worked hard enough to understand it so I be, could be contextual in my understanding with Kwok. It was not to write a book about the history of Vietnam, but it was to understand it. So Vietnam is a, this long-standing uh, enmity between Vietnam and China for a couple millennia. They haven't gotten along. Vietnam wasn't always Vietnam. It's been bounded by the same geographical boundaries. I mean, you've got the highlands and the mountains in the west, and you've got the ocean in the east. That's kind of immutable. Uh, but Vietnam only extended down to what, what we sort of view as uh, Vietnam, extended only down to Hue and Da Nang. And to the south of there was a people called the, the Cham people, C-H-A-M. And if I mispronounce that, I apologize if people are experts in 
in the pronunciation. But so they were a, they were a different tribe than the people in the north. But over the course of the years, they they had their conflicts with China. They lost some, they won some. But in 938, the Win uh, ruling family, the Win um, Empire, defeated the Chinese uh, in 938. That's a long time ago. And then, of course, there was conflict after that. And that conflict is something to remember because even to this day, if you ask somebody, doesn't matter where they were born, North or South Vietnam, and you call it the South China Sea, you will be gently corrected and say, please say East Sea, because they don't call it the South China Sea. And to this day, there's still arguments over the Paracels Islands and, of course, the Spratly Islands to a lesser degree for the Vietnamese, but the Paracels on the 16th parallel are very, very important to the Vietnamese. But you, we Europeans, we made it out there. We sent missionaries out there. And then as, when the missionaries weren't accepted, the French missionaries, we said, we're going to have to send some, send some troops in. And at that point, in the, in the 19th century, the French had one of the best armies in the world, as you know. And they sent the French into Vietnam, the troops, and they basically said, we're going to, we're going to put Francaise civilization, I think that's pronounced right, into Vietnam. And they established their hegemony over Vietnam. And that occurred in the late 19th century. That extended through 19. 45 with ups and downs and one of the uh, if you if you think about it rubber was not came out of South America and then it was exported to Asia and of course a great place to grow it was in in all the rubber plantations in Vietnam along with other uh, other crops that, that came that, that were used that were uh, harvested like rice it was a great rice producer but in 1941, well, earlier than 1941, France fell. France fell to the Germans. If you remember, there was a conflict. It was called the Vichy French in one, the south, southern part of France. And the rest of, they, they were complicit in some respects with the Germans. And they were the ones that administered Indochina, French Indochina, for the Japanese throughout most of the war, till about 44, 45. That's something that I didn't understand until I started reading a lot of books about Vietnam. And that really kind of changed the tenor of what, uh, what happened in the post-colonial world. If FDR had lived, a lot of things might have changed. FDR told Churchill, I, I don't want, I, I want you to get out of your, your colonies. This, this whole colonial outlook has got to change. He never was able to convince uh, de, Gaulle, de Gaulle of much. And after the, after, as the war ended, around 44, 45, there was a huge amount of conflict. The Chinese came in at one point. The Japanese, of course, left. And a guy named Ho Chi Minh, in, in around 1945, said, we're going to start fighting the French because you're not coming back. The French did come back, and there was a period in which we call the French War. French War was about 10 year period, and it involved a, a tragedy of major proportions with a famine that occurred in Vietnam with close to 4 million people that died in 46 and 47. And Nothing was very, nothing's ever been real easy in history. Nothing's been ever clean and clear cut, and it wasn't clear cut there. But the French fought the Viet Minh, and the Viet Minh were a nationalist group. They weren't communist. They were a nationalist group with communist leadership predominantly, but a lot of different nationalist fact, factions throughout all of North and South Vietnam. Kwok's father, Sung, fought for the Viet Minh in what, is, what was South Vietnam. And he was imprisoned by the Viet Minh because he wasn't a communist. He was imprisoned because the communists eventually took over the Viet Minh. 
And what happened, of course, we all know Dien Bien Phu. I tell you, the best book I've read on Dien Bien Phu is Valley of Death by Ted Morgan. I'd highly recommend it because it gives you just this wonderful background and, and, and how the French paratroopers really fought very hard and very well, but the Viet Minh fought even better. Of course, being in a valley is not a great place of uh, defensive position. So all that's to tell you the background. That's all to tell you the background. Some people grew up in the shadow of that war. Here's a young man born in 1946, Kwok Pham, one of nine children. His father is a successful merchant mariner. Uh, he, he was a chief engineer on a commercial vessel. His mother, Vo, was the matriarch of the family. That war didn't really emerge for him until 1959. This, this is where, what we, there's sections in the book that talk about this, where war came home to him. War came home to him when he was a young man, when his grandmother's village was burnt down. And the Viet Cong emerged as the NLF in 1960. And um, if, you, if you remember in 1954 in the Geneva Accords, the 800,000 people from the north came south, maybe close to a million. No, numbers are hard to totally recollect. And 100,000 went north, and they were mostly Viet Minh who, who later became part of the NVA. Reminds you when you graduated from high school, doesn't it? We all had fun. Your life went on even though things were happening to you. There's a young man, a bright future all ahead of him. Just, just laughing and having fun, quacks on the bottom. And the, when I was in school, if you had a Harley or you had any kind of motorcycle, you were pretty hot stuff. And of course, this is the most ubiquitous form of transportation in Vietnam. There's, uh, I think we were told when we were over there, 12 million motorbikes um, in Saigon. And, and as you know, anybody here been to Vietnam other than when you've served over there, but lately as a tourist? December. December. You don't, cross the, you don't cross the street in, uh, in uh, Vietnam. As a matter of fact, they told us, if you really have to cross the street, take a cab. <laughs> Put your blinders on. So, so Kwok Pham, um, he, he grew up and he, he, when he graduated from high school, he went to work for the US Air Force. And he was actually out uh, as a translator. He was very pretty proficient in English even then. He went out and uh, helped set up bases for the U.S. Uh, Air Force. But he said he got tired of getting shot at when he was out in the countryside, so he came to, back to work in the US Ar for the U.S. Army in logistics in Saigon. Then he said, there's no future here. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to go do what my dad did, and I'm going to become a ship's officer at the Maritime Academy. And he went to the Futo University, and it was a maritime program, two-year program, very much like the Mass Maritime Program. There he learned navigation. He learned navigation like we don't teach navigation nowadays. He, he was an expert in celestial nav, absolutely lives and breathes navigation. You don't, uh, you don't even have to hesitate to know what point of the compass you are, uh, you're on with, uh, with Quoc Pham. He also learned things, uh, are, do we have deck officers on board here? Any, any here? So the Nautical Almanac, I don't know if they taught you how to interpolate the nautical almanac so you could look at a nautical almanac and convert it to another year. Now, my brother doesn't teach that and doesn't know that. Quok learned that. So you could take a, an old nautical almanac and turn it into a new nautical almanac with a lot of interpolate. I guess it's interpolation um, of the data. There he is at age 20. And he served in 1969. Uh, as a ship's officer in a 500-ton tanker, not tanker, a cargo, a freighter, uh, just coastal. And he became a proficient pilot. He got signed off as a pilot on the Saigon River. And I, and I do respect the fact that the Saigon River is more than one river, but there's, there's different routes down the Saigon River. But for the purposes of here, we'll just call it the Saigon River, which is essentially what, what the large ships take, smaller ships can take other tributaries down. <laughs> But 1970 looms and he gets called up and drafted. He gets drafted as a, um, as a naval officer. And he spends uh, nine months in training. And this is with his sister, Lon. 
And it's the only picture we have of him in uniform because at the end of the war, his mother destroyed all of his uniforms, destroyed all the pictures that would identify him, and she just happened to didn't see this, not see this. So uh, that, that, the, the enormity of trying to erase that part of history is huge. But this is a photo of him. And after nine months, he got assigned as, uh, as an officer on an LST, which is uh, not a very elegant way to travel, I guess, but uh, it was used as a freighter. And they actually supported the Cambodian operation, uh, going over to Phnom Penh. But then he wrangled a berth uh, on the largest ship in the Vietnamese Navy, which was called a frigate. Now, this frigate that he served on, the uh, Tran Quang Kai had a rich history. It was a seaplane tender for the US Navy during World War II. Then after the World War II, the, the Coast Guard said, we'll take it, and turned it into a Coast Guard cutter and called it the Bering Strait. And it was a WHEC. There's three types of cutters, but the high endurance cutter apparently has good range, and it's got a good five inch gun on it, and it's got great utility. So Quok served as the the head of the Department for Navigation and honed his skills even further as a navigator. That's, that's uh, in the Coast Guard colors as the Bering Strait and uh, as the, the, the uh, Quang Kai. He served on that until about March of 1975. That's a key date. And there's a picture, we're not sure exactly which frigate they're boarding, but we're told that that's the frigate that they boarded. Now, what happens when the matriarch of the family looks at you and says these words? I'll let you read them. So what's mom saying? What's Vo saying? I got a girl for you. I got a girl for you, an arranged marriage an arranged marriage, which is not uncommon. And you grew up with her. She was a kid when you were a little bit older. She was a kid. And you're going to marry her because you're going to carry on the FOM name. Uh, I don't want to. I don't. Yeah, you're going to. So the marriage occurred. And it was the luckiest moment of his life. I could say that about my own marriage, the luckiest moment of my, own, my life. This, this dear, dear woman, her name's Duong, Duong T. Kim Kung. We call her Kim Kung. It means diamond. It means diamond in Vietnam. And she was a diamond. She was an absolute diamond, a gem of a human being. I've never met her and I love her like a sister. My wife has never met her and love, love her like a sister. She is the hero of this story. Like so many other stories in history, it's the woman that has the not just the intellect, but the intuition that tells you what needs to be done. And she was there for him throughout his time, arranged marriage or not, they had a deep and abiding love. Now in, uh, in our cultures, we don't do this, but when a man gets married, his wife moves into his family's house. I'm not sure that would have gone over real big in, <laughs> in my marriage, uh, maybe, maybe not yours either, but that's Vo on the left, Kwok's wife. And that little infant between them is the ship's officer you saw on the training ship Kennedy. That is Hung Pham, when he was less than two years old, sitting next to his mother. Can you see okay, Bob? Sorry. Uh, sitting next to his mother, Kim Kung. So April 1975 looms. We know that the Paris Peace Accords were signed in January 73, right? And then Congressional action prohibited, explicitly prohibited any military action on our part on, on 15 August. It was a church amendment. I think it was called Case Church Amendment in 15 August uh, 1975. So we were proscribed from being involved in conflict. There were obviously military people there attached to the embassy and support and advisors, but not, not fighting. You all remember Watergate. Not everybody here remembers Watergate. Some people probably weren't born during Watergate, but Watergate changed history. When we make dumb mistakes as politicians and as human beings, it can change history. 
Nixon, who, who kind of had a good handle, I believe, on, on foreign policy, whether we agree or disagree with how he approached the Vietnam War, he saw a chess game that very few people have been able to uh, see in the past. But Watergate emerged, so he became weaker and weaker and weaker. And in 1974, August of 1974, if memory serves, he resigned. Well, he had made an implicit promise, perhaps explicit, to two to force him to sign the Paris Peace Accords. Something happens. The North comes south. I'm here to defend you. We'll get fighters. We'll get bombers. We'll stop them. Well, Ford was toothless. He, couldn't, he didn't have any power, President Ford. And so in January of 1975, the North Vietnamese go, let's start. Let's try it. And they start heading south. And the South Vietnamese don't have a lot of fuel and, and ammunition because they're not getting resupplied to the extent that they want. And we can argue whether they, they were great fighters or they were poor fighters. I, I happen to think that there's always good fighters in any group of, of uh, human beings. We, we have, we've had great fighters in our past and we've had not so great fighters. But the support wasn't there and the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese just inexorably marched south. Two pulled people out of the provinces and by April, early April of 1975, the die was almost cast. The die was almost cast and they were, they were knocking on the door of South Vietnam. Now there were three different paths people could take. You could escape, you could stay, or you could escape and then decide to come back. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. So we think numbers are hard to find in Vietnam. We know precisely how many people served in Vietnam from the American Armed Forces. Sadly, we know precisely how many died. We don't know how many people died on both sides in Vietnam. We think it was around three million around three million people on both sides, on a base of 17 million people in, in uh, South Vietnam. But we think around 120 to 140,000 people left. Now, a lot of these people obviously were high-ranking people and paid their way out, and some people were corrupt, no doubt. But they left, they left. Of those 120 to 40,000, 20 to 30,000 left on the Navy ships, 30 Navy ships, South Vietnamese naval ships, in the Saigon, Saigon River. On April 28th, they steamed out of, out of uh, Saigon. Kwok saw them, saw, went there th th that morning and saw that they had left, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Um, and, of course, April 30th, it was mayhem. Now, some stayed, obviously they had to stay, 17 million people couldn't escape the country, but there was this mixed feeling. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen when the, the North makes it here. First of all, they, maybe they won't make it here. We've been, had our back against the wall so many times in the past. The, we've got paratroopers here. They're gonna hold Saigon, because they were good fighters. But most people felt this is inevitable. This is going to happen to us. Maybe there won't be retribution. Maybe there is a future for us. But they didn't know. And then some people actually did escape, and then they decided to return. Now there's the iconic photograph. People tell you it's the U.S. Embassy, it's not. It's uh, actually at 22 Jia Long Street, which is about a half mile from the embassy, on uh, an Air America helicopter. And uh, they left by helicopter, they left a lot, lot by the, the marine helicopters, that, which carried a lot more. There's a picture in April 1975. They were fleeing by boat uh, down the river and out to sea in, in any boat that they could find. Then the USS Kirk. So April 28th, the, the South Vietnamese naval fleet leaves and they, they're, they're supposed to meet up with the US fleet and uh, to, to be escorted to wherever they might be able to go. So it was called Operation Frequent Wind and Admiral Donald Whitmire got word, three words, we forgot them. We forgot them is what's recorded in history. We forgot the South Vietnamese Navy. So Whitmire gets a hold of a three-tour uh, naval officer who is now civilian, I think working for the CIA. I can't tell you for sure. The CIA won't answer my calls. Uh, Richard Armitage, who later became uh, 
famous for a lot of different reasons, but he was a, a deputy, um, uh, deputy, um, uh, he, wor he worked for uh, the, the State Department as one of the deputies there. He, he ends up landing by helicopter and he says to the, uh, the captain, Paul Jacobs, I'm in charge and we're going to pick up the South Vietnamese Navy. Now, the captain didn't take too well to the civilian orders, but I guess he didn't have much choice. We don't know to this day whether Armitage had approval or not, and maybe some of you can tell me afterwards whether he had approval or not. He, on his own, said, we're going to Civic Bay. They didn't have the range, I guess. They didn't have the fuel on board, so Civic Bay was the best option. So they headed to Civic Bay, and they led 20 to 30,000 people to rescue. And, and why the number, numbers vary so much, I can't tell you, but that's what the history is. And they got to Civic Bay, and, and that, that uh, frigate that Quark served on, 100 miles out of Civic Bay, raised the American flag, and it was given to the Philippine Navy uh, once it got there. Then this is the most tragic story in that, that particular time, in that month, and those months afterwards. The people that went to Subic Bay, or the people that escaped and got to Guam, and Guam was one of the prime places that people went to, some of them were crew members on the, on the uh, naval ships. Some of them got there and, and said, wait a second, my family didn't get out, they're stuck back in Vietnam, and some of them had second thoughts. So they went on hunger strikes, and they protested to the American Navy and finally, the Americans relented and said, take one of the cargo ships, the Vietnam Tung Tin, and head back to Vietnam. 1,500 people. Now, Captain True was the second captain of Quok's LST. He was, on, and, and True captained the ship, long voyage back from Guam. I don't know why it took two weeks, but it took him two weeks. When they got to Vung Tau, they were all imprisoned. They looked pretty happy here, but they weren't ha happy when they landed. 1,500 people got imprisoned. The captain was in re-education camps, prison camps, concentration camps for 14 years until he got released through the humanitarian operation when 70,000 people got released in 1988, 1999. So th there, there are three different categories, escape, stay, or go back. None of them was a good choice. I think I told you to begin with that the arc of this story is Quark and the arc of Vietnam. This is some of the people who are captured in Da Nang. And this is the, the decisions that Quark had to make. He went back to his family's house in the end of April, and he sat with 14 family members, and he said, do I leave or do I stay? And if you bear with me, I'm gonna read just a short section. 14 family members struggling with a decision you and I will never have to make. Some people in their, this room, their, their families had to make a decision whether to leave Germany uh, after World War I because there was such a depression there. Nobody, most people, Americans, have never considered this. Do I leave my country? Finally, only Kwok and Kim Kung struggled with the decision they had to make, hugging their sleeping children as if this were their last day together. The couple ran the many options over and over in conversation and in times of quiet reflection in their own minds. Sweetheart, I can't leave you and Nan, but Kwok, if you stay, the communists will punish you. They would be stupid to do it, Quok, take home with you, get to America or Australia or wherever you can. I'll be safe here with my family until you can send for me, but I can't live without you. And if you stay, you know, might not be with me anyway. That morning, occasional explosions sounded in the distance. They came from mortars and heavy artillery fired from both sides. They struck both military and civilian targets, often in neighborhoods filled with innocent citizens. But to the communists, no one was innocent in Saigon. They didn't know it yet, but the citizens were all considered war criminals, and most especially those who wore the uniform of South Vietnam. So they decided, Kwok and his wife decided, he would leave with Yang Hung. 
and he would get on a Navy ship. He could go on the Navy ship. Remember the Navy ships? 20 to 30,000 people leaving. But Kwok had second thoughts. He sent his wife off to live with, to be with her family, and he had second thoughts, and he changed his mind. He changed his mind. I can't say that I blame him. He couldn't leave his wife, his, his two children at that point, and his extended family. Several days later, after the fall of Vietnam, up, this is what happens. Kim, could, Kim Kung stood there yelling at him. You're so stupid, Kwok. Why didn't you leave when you had a chance? Don't you know what will happen to you? I did it for you. I did it for us. I did it for my family. How could you do this, Kwok? We had a plan. Now what do you think will happen? But aren't you happy I'm here? Don't you love me? I would be happier if you were safe, my love. Now I'm afraid for you. And, and she had every right to be afraid of her. The curtain came down over South Vietnam. A dome came over South Vietnam where people's radios were confiscated, broadcasts ended, and loudspeakers were set up on street corners throughout Saigon. And they blasted Ho Chi Minh's truth. They blasted, you're going to report to re-education. Anybody that served in the, in the, in the for armed forces or the government officials, you're gonna go to re-education. And they made a decision, Kwok changed it, and Kim Kung knew that it was the wrong decision, but she supported him. Uh, I, was, I, was, I spoke to a group in New York and said, the, the New Yorkers said, I, I, I think I would have been angrier than Kim Kung. And she used some rather good New York terms. Um, so the re-education camps, what a great sounding term. To this day, the, the Vietnamese uh, government will tell you Perhaps 20 to 30,000 people served in the camps of uh, re-education camps. They were there for a short period of time and received a re-education and were released. That's the official line. Now we don't know how many people got sent to the re-education camps, but we know that they were, there was a bait and switch. The Chinese had taught them well. Send, send people that you think are going to rise against you that are educated. Similar to Paul Pot. Paul Pot Anybody that wore glasses was killed in Cambodia. Why? They presumed they could read. In South Vietnam, it was more pernicious. Send them to the re-education camps. So he was sent to, they were sent to re-education camps. Now, elegantly done. All the enlisted people, you go to camps, camp for three days. You're just gonna learn Ho Chi Minh's law. It was very, very much Ho Chi Minh oriented, as you can imagine, even though he had died in 69. Ho Chi Minh's law, and we're gonna release you. Perhaps 1.5 million people went to camps over the course of May, April, uh, May and early June, 1975. And true to their word, three days later, the enlisted people came back and they said, that wasn't that bad. They just harangued us about uh, Ho Chi Minh and told us we had to confessed to our crimes, and, and that was it. So the next group to go were the junior officers. So the junior officers heard the loudspeakers and they had to report. Now, if they didn't report, they were gonna get captured by the NVA because they knew where they were and people were uh, ostensibly, I guess, ratting them out. So he reported to a camp, he, he, he reported to a high school, I should say, 2,000 people in a, high, in a high school, and to show you, it's sometimes a strange situation. He prepared for 10 days, he brought some money, and when he got to the high school, they, did, they weren't prepared in any way, and they had to send out for Chinese food. Uh, so there are some funny aspects to this, but three days later, they were sent to Tain In. It was a 10, 12-hour convoy, and 30 people in the back of a truck designed for, for 12 or 15, and they spent three months in Tain In. Kwok weighed 115 pounds when he first entered the camps. They got to Tain In, there was no food. They had to forage, do whatever they could. And he weighed 85 pounds three years later. He went from Tain In, he went to a series of camps. At one camp, there was an ammunition dump. And why the ammunition dump was sitting there and what lit it off, but the ammunition dump lit off, and you can read about it in the book. I have books for sale in the back if you want, uh, after, the, after, the, uh, after the talk. But one lit off and 300 people estimated to, to have died as all the rounds cooked off. And Kwok 
found God that night when he prayed that he would be spared, and he was spared. And he's a very devout, eclectic religious person with a strong Catholic and Buddhist faith, uh, which um, I, I so admire. Then the senior officers were sent to 30 days. Some of them spent 17 years in camps. Kwok's brother spent 13 years in camps. And those people that were released ended up, uh, they weren't very healthy. And Kwok's brother died a couple years after he got out because you don't go through that level of malnutrition. This is what Kwok was told by his wife, wife's uncle, who was, they'd learned, was Viet Cong. You will be a prisoner until your children have children. Can't be, it can't be, Kwok said. Just what I said, Utuk said. Just what I said. And Utuk, by, by the way, later on was, was treated very poorly uh, because the NVA came down and they pushed the Viet Cong aside uh, and administered the country from the North people. What, where do you come up with numbers that range from three to 500,000? You go through a lot of sources and you see a lot of uh, citations and that the numbers vary that much. So I did my own analysis and I figured how many people served in the Vietnamese armed forces, how many people were likely to have been governmental officials, what percentage of people were officers, what percentage were people were high ranking government officials and try to do an analysis. And it, and it sort of correlated to the low end, perhaps 350,000 were sent to the camps for a long period of time. Can't tell you for sure, but I worked really hard on that analysis, and I didn't take at face value anything. Uh, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it was even more than 350,000. And 100,000 at least died in the camps. Some to malnutrition, some to getting shot. Some people who chose to commit suicide rather than stay in the camps. 100,000 people died. That's 40,000 more people that died, Americans that died. It was horrible, and we, didn't, we don't know that. I didn't know that. 1975 to 85 is still called the 10 dark years. After a war, it becomes an economic depression. It's made even worse if you instill in Soviet-style economic planning methods. Uh, by that time, the, the, the Chinese weren't real allies, and the Russians were, were more the, in their sphere. And uh, it, it became a very dark time. This is not a real picture. I, I have a big note to Bene on the bottom, but I only pull that up because we don't have any pictures of Quark's camps. We went to all the locations where the camps are. The whole world has changed. There are no camps there. Uh, but Quark said this represents what they, what they had to build. They got to a location and they were given rudimentary tools. Sometimes they had to find downed aircraft to make tools and they had to go out into the forest and we call it jungle, but it was a deciduous forest. Uh, and they had to build all of their own, all of their own huts. And this is, this is kind of what they, they lived in. And back in Saigon, it wasn't pretty. Kim Kung had to feed her infants water to try to fill their bellies. Had to feed them water to fill their bellies because she didn't have enough milk to give them. And, uh, they, they would just cry and cry and cry. And they, they could get rations once a month. It was enough to, for a family to eat for three or four days. So they used a black market. They had to sell whatever food stuff they had. Kwok's father died of diabetes and his mother still thinks he died of a broken heart. Because broken heart, he argued so much with his communist sympathizer son. And when he died, he, they had to make, hand make the coffin to, build, to bury him. As you know, in Vietnam, you're buried for a couple of years, and then they dig up the remains and then put you in, a, in an urn. Uh, but he had to be buried in a handmade coffin, or that they just use scrap lumber to do it. In the meantime, Quark's three years in the camp. Three years in the camp, and he, he finally, they finally get some, the, the, the uh, families can visit, and there's a little bit of loosening because they want people to go to the new economic zone, which was uh, 
collective farms where people were sent again out of the city so they couldn't rise up against the, the regime. And uh, he was sent to Lai Ke, and he spent several months there. And Kim Kung came over and uh, was very receptive to the village chief to make sure that she, she set the stage that they really liked it and they wanted to stay even though they didn't. But one day, uh, the dis village chief called him in and said, I need three volunteers to go to the Cambodian border, 1978. And Kwok was voluntold uh, to go to the Cambodian border. And after he got there, the next morning, he was given a bamboo stick with a nail on the end, and he became a human mind detector. And they lined him up, and they proceeded to try to, to find the mines. Kwok estimates that 15% of the people died every day, 15%. But Kwok, pretty smart guy, I won't do a complete spoiler, but he used toothpaste to escape. He used toothpaste to escape because toothpaste made by the Chinese, every army needs toothpaste, it needs everything. Toothpaste used by the Chinese has diglyceride compounds in it that if you eat too much, you'll be paralyzed or die. And it, actually, we used it in all of our elixirs until the 1930s, and that's what caused the FDA to be formed. Kwok knew that, went to the district communist chief, said, I'm going to be your consigliore. That's the word I use with Kwok. I said, is there a word for consigliore in Vietnamese? And Kwok laughed. He says, no, but I know what you mean. So he used that, and they sold that with little ounces of gold that people were able to bring into the camps from the new economic zone. And they would get so debilitated that the, that the chief would sign their parole papers to go back home. And Kwok did that and earned the trust of the chief. And Kim Kung knew that. And Kim Kung devised an escape plan. And she has uh, devised an escape plan. So she, they used 15 different cutouts. They used water buffaloes. They used buses. They walked and 15 different cut-ups, nobody could follow them, and they got back to the streets of Saigon. Kwok did not live with his family during the day. He lived on the streets. After dark, he would go back to his home and before sunrise, and many times he had to scrap, go up to the roof to be, uh, not be captured by the local police. And then the boat people. Now the boat people are two distinct groups, the Wa, the Sino-Vietnamese, the Vietnamese did not particularly like the Chinese, the Chinese Vietnamese, Sino-Vietnamese. Uh, so they basically let them buy their way out of uh, Vietnam. And thousands left Vietnam until it reached crisis proportions in late 1978 and 79. And the UN said, you've got to figure this out, guys. And they came up with the orderly departure program, which really lessened the number of boat people. And they started leaving by commercial air and, and boat. And uh, that, that helped the, the Sino-Vietnamese, the Chinese Vietnamese leave. But in the meantime, people that were convicts on the lam, like Kwok, he still had to get out of town. He, he still had to leave. He got hired uh, first on a 100-foot vessel that they were going to convert for seed going duty. Those of you that, oops, oops. So those, those of you that uh, know boats probably can tell you that's not a seed going vessel. He was, he was modifying it. And once the ODP came around, the orderly departure program, the, the communists pulled off target and tried to arrest him. And he escaped uh, just minutes before he was going to be arrested. But then he got hired to take a 37-foot boat, which had as subterfuge to work for the, the Vietnamese government to bring workers down to Vung Tau. And that is a picture taken while we were on the research trip, because Kwok said to me, as we were sitting there on a high-speed hydrofoil going down the river, he says, that's my boat. That's my boat, and that's the only shot I could get. So I blew that up. He says, that's what my boat looked like. It's got, it had about a 15-cylinder diesel. It sounded like tuk, 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 if you've heard those. And that's similar to, we found that, uh, his son found that when, when a rescue took place. It was a German freighter that picked up people. And it was a boat like that. Now. 37 feet, you're all mariners, I'm not. 37 feet, 10 foot beam. Any guess on how many people were on that boat? Well, 50, about 51, 51 people. And then they were boarded by militia. 
And the militia had a lottery to get on the boat. And they ended up with 55 people. They ended up heading into the East Sea into a storm. Because if you're a mariner and you want to escape, you go into a storm and you have confidence in your own abilities. He, he uh, used gold that he got from the guy that organized uh, the, the escape. And he went to a, a stevedore and said, I need a, uh, need a, a, a sextant. And the guy says, I don't know what the sextant is. So he sketched it out and that night met him and paid him in gold. And the stevedore said, it's amazing what you can find on the bridge of a Russian ship. <laughs> um, and so he took that, that and he took a 1971 almanac, a nautical almanac, and converted it to 1980. He converted it. it took him months to do that. And he, he got a good compass, and he got reflect, reflective, he, he put metal, a metal structure up for radar, and he headed out to sea because he knew if you go out to sea, you're not going to get caught by the pirates, you're less likely because the pirates hug the coast. And he headed out, and uh, there, I, I'm running short on time, but there's a lot of description of what, they, what occurred for them. But the people were 55 people aboard. He actually had to nail the hatches shut, and they were stuck in an area this high. And people had totally abraded backs, but they were, and, and fevers, Hung, the, the young boy, had 103 fever. But they come across, I'm, I'm sorry, the mariner's skills paid off for him, because he did all those things that I just talked about. And that was their escape route, about 135 magnetic heading initially to the sea routes. He knew that where the, the, the routes were. And what does he see in the distance? He sees a U.S. Naval combat, shores, uh, uh, combat stores ship, the USS San Jose, 600 feet long, coincidentally the same length as the training ship Kennedy. He run, runs into this. Well, actually, it was steaming away from him. And he was able to uh, use his... Uh, mirror and get their attention and slowly but surely they turned around and they headed towards him. That's another shot of the San Jose and that's the captain. He was a, an aviator who, who took out command of a ship and ended up, I think he, he commanded the Nimitz if, if I'm correct, I'm, I'm sorry I can't remember right off the bat later, but I interviewed him. He said to this day those rescues, he did two rescues are the most important part of his career. They're the most significant part of his career. The mariners that I talked to that rescued people always say that. And, and we're talking about merchant vessels and we're talking about naval vessels. And very seldom did a U.S. Navy ship turn and not help. One, one Navy officer was court-martialed, by the way, for not providing uh, help in the early 80s. Uh, but that's a completely different story. And this is an email from Admiral Johnson. What a neat guy. He's probably 84. I hope I'm that sharp when I'm 84, but uh, does anything ever change? There's the Spratleys, even back then. And you know where they were headed? They were going from Subic Bay to the Arabian Sea to support Desert One, the Iranian hostage crisis. It's amazing how all these things flow together. He was making his second run there second run. On the run back to Subic Bay, he got, on the first trip, he found a group of uh, Vietnamese and on the way down. And he took them to, uh, that must have been the most beautiful ship in the world, a 37-foot boat. These are the actual U.S. Navy photos, the rescues, the rescue. And that's the iconic photo that's on the cover. That's Kim Kung's uncle in the center. I don't have this on automatic. I don't know why it's moving. Um, but they were originally going to just drop some food on board. And Kwok brought the pregnant women and the young children up on board and held them up. And Johnson said, no, we're going we're to bring them aboard. Most of them were so debilitated they had to be brought up in mail nets. Kwok made it up to Jacob's Ladder. Great, great photos, U.S. Navy, and the Navy archives and the U.S. Um, National Archives are fantastic people, by the way. And that's them brought on board. They, they gave them uh, dungarees and, and uh, 
and uh, and just T-shirts. Uh, they they sequestered them. You always sequestered them on the on the uh, hangar deck, and that boy hugging the young boy, the boy being hugged on the on the right is Hung Pham. He had 103 fever. He doesn't look too good. I'm sorry, this is moving forward. Um, he doesn't look too good, but he, he got a lot better shortly thereafter. The transition, the book ends here. The second book starts here. That'll take about two and a half years. Um, but the transition, the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees Camp in Saigon, in uh, Singapore, at Hawkins Road, an, uh, an old British army base. Uh, he had two and a half months there. And then he made it to Haverhill Mass in the middle of a blinding blizzard without a coat uh, and was, was uh, brought here. And it took nine years because he was an escaped convict to get his wife and by then three children out of Vietnam. Nine years. And to this day, that family struggles with those nine years in their own way. What happened? Why did dad leave for nine years? His wife couldn't understand. How do you understand? How do you make meaning of that? This is his identification at Hawkins Road. And there's a wonderful picture of Kim Kuhn. So he, he finally, it was, took Chet Atkins, a US congressman and first term Senator John McCain to go to the Vietnamese delegation at the United Nations and said, you gotta help us. And Kwok was reunited with his family. Kim Kung came with the three children, three children that he'd never met. He'd never met those children. I mean, they were just infants when he left. They didn't know him. They didn't know whom. And that's a picture after they came, after they came back and they spent 20 years together. But somebody's missing from this picture the hero of the story, Kim Kung. She died in 2009 from lupus, complications from lupus. People say stress makes lupus worse. She must have lived one of the most stressful lives, but she was the hero. She got him out. This is his, he, he met another woman about three years later. She's an absolute sweetheart. Her family had escaped from the north to the south in 1954 and then she escaped in 1976. And uh, her name's Jung, Jung Nguyen, and she's just a fantastic person. There's some acknowledgements. There's Jen, uh, Gene Connor. I never thought I'd call an admiral by his first name. It took me a long time to get used to that. There's Gene Connor. There's uh, uh, Admiral Johnson, who came to visit Kwok when we talked in Florida. 60 people in the room. There wasn't a dry eye in the house as they hugged each other. Lieutenant General that I worked for, Mac Armstrong, who went through the book twice and provided a lot of expertise. Colonel Charles Tutt, who served a ground tour as a platoon commander in Vietnam, went back to flight school and then went back to fly in Vietnam, did two tours in Vietnam, and has made five trips to Vietnam and spends a lot of time with North Vietnamese fighter pilots and has become dear friends with many of them. Of course, the man I entered the world with, Tom Bushy, but most importantly, my friend Kwok Pham, who gave me the gift to tell his story, and a story that needed to be told because I myself felt I had looked away. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>